let's talk surveillance systems. At least in the US, things got a little more complicated because of the entity list. I did a video a long time ago on Synology surveillance station and the software and getting everything set up and Synology really is the easy button. They've only improved since that video. But I thought it was still worth talking about and taking a look at some new software features and taking a look at the kind of stuff you can get because there's a mobile app, there's a desktop app, there's a web app that you can get to and you don't need the most expensive Synology unit. You can actually come out with a system that costs less than a dedicated surveillance system and works better. And if you've got Hike Vision or High K Vision cameras that are, you know, floating around your establishment, well, I've got some bad news. They're on the entity list now, along with Dahua and a whole bunch of other companies. Now, sometimes just because the sticker doesn't say Hick Vision or High K Vision doesn't mean that they're not also on the entity list. This is sort of an annoyance for Synology. So now they have their own cameras, the TC500, which we're going to take a look at, and the BC500. These are basically the same camera. There's a couple things we need to talk about, but the thing to look for is these are NDAA and TAA compliant, which means that they're not, not on the naughty list, they're on the approved list, which if you're replacing a system like this and you want to indemnify yourself against, against somebody coming in later and saying you didn't install the right kind of cameras, you need that. Whether you're installing these at a fire station or a police station or a government building or something government building adjacent, like if it's a, a building that contains a, a fallout shelter or a storm shelter or something like that, anything that gets federal dollars, you're going to have to use something that's NDAA, TAA compliant. And Synology is that. And so it's basically a license to print money for them. But let's dive in. Let's, let's, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's take a look. These are IP cameras. And believe it or not, this camera is actually 8 megapixels. And these cameras are only 5 megapixels. But these are actually better cameras. Seems impossible, right? Okay, yeah, no, full disclosure, I do wish these were also eight megapixel cameras, but the image sensor quality on these is better. It's a better quality picture, even though these are five megapixel. But Synology, if you're listening, come out with eight megapixel versions that are also really good. You need to. These cameras also have built-in AI for face detection and license plate recognition. And that's really nice. There are also built-in microphones for these. Depending on your jurisdiction, you may or may not be allowed to record audio with your surveillance footage. That's something we'll talk about when we get to the software part of this. But you can deploy these pretty much universally. Now, if you're not read in on the Synology ecosystem, when you buy a Synology NAS, this does a lot more than just surveillance. This can be a whole small business server. You can use this for backups. You can even use this for cloud backups. If you're on Office 365, for example, you can back up all of your Office 365 here. You should check out some of our other videos if this, you know, just watching this for surveillance. These can do a lot more and you pay for a lot more. The unit that I'm looking at with our surveillance here is the DS1823 XS Plus. Yeah, the XS means XS. When you buy one of these, you get a license for surveillance station, Synology surveillance station, their software. But it will only support, I think, two cameras out of the box. If you buy Synology brand cameras, each camera comes with its own license. So, for example, I could use some of our, you know, forbidden cameras. I mean, it depends on how you use them. They're, they're, you can use them on an isolated network to prevent them from phoning home. You wouldn't be able to do that for a commercial installation, but for, you know, keeping an eye on grandma's house. That could work fine, and I'll show you how to do that. But for a truly commercial solution, you just use these, and you'll always have the two free slots. So if you need a, a PTZ camera or a camera that has features that Synology doesn't offer, you can use one of your two free licenses for that, or you can use your two free licenses for those kind of feature cameras and plug them in here. Because the Synology software in Surveillance Station actually supports so many cameras that it's kind of mind-boggling. Like, they're paying somebody to add support and check things and be sure that stuff generally works. Okay, let's take a look at our cameras. Basically, it's just the form factor. Do you want a, a dome-style camera or do you want a bullet-style camera? Both of these have a three-year warranty. Both of them feature 2880 by 1620 at 30 FPS as their maximum resolution. Both of them feature 2.8 millimeter lenses. That means that you've got a horizontal view of about 110 degrees and a vertical view of about 56 degrees. So, it's pretty good. These are also what's called IP67. IP67 is a rating for waterproofness. So the fact that it is waterproof means that you can 
basically mount these outside. Now, I wouldn't mount these in direct weather, even though they are IP67, because, you know, you're thinking about three-year, five-year, ten-year timescales. Uh, under an overhang or something like that is sort of your ideal location. In the box, you get this little connector. This is a weatherizing connector. These cameras are designed to be used with Cat5 and Cat6 cabling, and you also get power over that cabling, power over Ethernet, PoE. And this weatherizing connector is something you slide over the cable before you've actually terminated it. If you've never terminated a cable before, it's really not a big deal. You've got this little end and a rubber grommet. You slide that on, you slide this on the cable, and then you have a locking connector that seals an RJ45 connection. These are cool because it keeps all of the, the weathering and water and stuff out of your RJ45 connection. These cameras do support an auxiliary 12 volt input. That's this. It's got a nice little weatherizing seal. Generally, if you're using this for 12 volt thing for anything other than testing and really probably not even that, you're doing it wrong. You really want to use power over ethernet. These also support a micro SD card. If you take this door off, you're going to be able to install a micro SD card and so that you can record storage here locally. You're not going to be able to use any micro SD card, unfortunately, because they will wear out. You have to get a video rated micro SD card. And the reason for that is because the right endurance of a video rated micro SD card is probably two orders of magnitude better than your standard issue micro SD card. Maybe even for a digital camera would be okay, but there are surveillance rated micro SD cards and if the company making those is not ripping you off, that actually does mean something different under the hood. We've also got three mounting screws on this. It's got a nice little connection here and this is not a secure connection. You wouldn't be able to put this camera somewhere where people can physically get at it or physically touch it. Again, you want it to be up out of reach under an overhang or something like that. Somewhere that it's not going to be in direct weather, but it, it can get rained on, it can get wet. It's not, not really a problem. Other than this micro SD card door, there is no need to ever open this. There is a daylight sensor. There is an appealing protective plastic, but you don't actually want to take the plastic off until you get this thing physically mounted where you're going to put it. And this is the, the bullet style camera, which could be mounted you know, under that overhang and then you can position it and rotate it however you want. Uh, it can also be mounted on a wall and you can spin this around. So a horizontally or vertical mount for this, either one will work. This is my personal favorite kind of camera. Sometimes that doesn't work for one reason or another. You can also use this, the bullet style is what it's called. It's not really a bullet, but it's a little different physical form factor. This is our TC500, here's our BC500. It's all the same features, it's all the same hardware under the hood, it's, it's literally just physical packaging. In my experience, this kind of mounting solution is a little easier to deal with if you're in a physically problematic location, like if you need it to, you know, be on an uneven surface or you have to deal with, with some unusual situation. This cable, you know, if you drill a one inch hole and you stuff all of this up into an overhang or something like that, you may not even need to use the ceiling stuff, but it does come with a seal connector and all of the other stuff that you need. It's got the micro SD card slot on the bottom. This always remains accessible, whereas with this, depending on how you get it mounted, that micro SD slot is not going to be easily accessible. So depending on what your plans are, it's like, ah, well, you know, I really would like that micro SD to be easily accessible. You could come get this. When you program one of these to record, if you program it for continuous recording or motion recording or something like that, it does secondarily record to the micro SD card slot according to the rules that you create. Surveillance Station actually gives you a lot of options to be able to do those kinds of things in software. We'll cover that more when we get to the software part of it. But yeah, it's basically physically a very similar situation. There's a protective plastic film on there and also you get a little bit of a weather lip, a weather housing here. So unless it's raining sideways, you know, as the rain beats down on the top of this, it's going to run off the top and then drip and not run down the face of the camera. Whereas that might be a little bit more of a problem with this. Again, you want to try to mount these out of direct weather, even though they're outside. Now let's talk power over ethernet and physical connections to your Synology. I've got our cameras just hanging out here on top. You're going to need a power over ethernet switch. Pretty much anything from the dawn of time will work. Not too old, but you know, POE. Not too old, but 802.3 AF. That's power over ethernet. It doesn't even have to be power over ethernet plus. And these cameras will work fine at 100 megabit. They don't even need gigabit because it's already all super compressed video. One of the most economical options that is easily remotely manageable is from Ingenious. I've covered these before, but this is the new Ingenious Fit line. So these are very small, very compact. This is the EWS 2910P Fit. So this is eight port gigabit layer two plus fit managed, which means that there's a web management app that goes with this. Uh, you can manage it locally with a key, but 
the fit line has the fit app there's another line that has another app that manages it and then you can also get locally managed versions that cost a little bit more this is one of the best options for a small eight port poe switch you've got two sfp this is not sfp plus this is just sfp gigabit for stacking because again these aren't really designed for super high power devices you can mix in wireless access points the ingenious also makes the fit line of wireless access points which are very very good you generally don't want to use wireless cameras of any kind those you're asking for trouble if you really want to talk about that maybe we can talk about that in a separate video but power over ethernet this is the lowest hanging fruit of uh of ease of use so we've got some connections here that are ready to go and our switch and so I'm just gonna plug this in real quick now I'm assuming that for security and other reasons you want to have your cameras on a physically separate network the Synology NASA's make that really easy because almost all of them have multiple built-in network ports this one has built-in 10 gigabit I've added a dual 25 gigabit connection on the side but you don't you don't even need 10 gigabit or anything it's just for the other off-label stuff I'm doing for this in fact if you're just going to do surveillance, don't get this. Like one of the dual hard drive Synology NASes, one of the ones that's got a little bit better CPU horsepower, is perfect. Look for maximum number of uh, supported cameras on it and make sure that fits with what you're planning to use the system for. But generally, these don't need a lot of horsepower. Oh, and Synology actually does make like full tilt insane surveillance systems that have a GPU in them that does real-time video processing above and beyond what these cameras can do. Generally, the way that the technology is going, though, is for each individual camera to do its own processing and then just use these for storage. So these, these really don't need a lot of horsepower to do video processing. And none of it is in the cloud. Like, the whole thing that sells me on this, the reason why I've got this set up at my mom's house and, and like, people that I know, I've helped them set this up at their house is because it's not cloud-connected in any way unless you want it to be. It can notify you of stuff over the cloud. And you can also set up rules for scrubbing video and that sort of thing. And you can also set it up so that it doesn't record anything from inside cameras when you're actually home. So if you would like to have inside cameras, but you don't want it to have inside cameras when you're home that record, or you want to have different rules for retention, like, okay, when I'm home, I only want to keep that for a day, but when I'm away, I want to keep that for a week, or, okay, you can record the garage all the time, but not the home. You can set all those rules up in the surveillance section. It's no problem. So I'll show you how to set this up physically wired. So, all right, our POE switch is booting up. Literally just connect this to that, and I'm going to connect this one to that one. And now you can see our camera, we got a blue light. It's a blue light special, it's like Kmart. Wow, I just may ship my pants. Yeah, ship your pants. Billy, you can ship your pants too. I can't wait to ship my pants, Dad. The blue light came on for a second and that shows us we got power, but in a second you'll also get a link light on the switch. Now the switch light doesn't necessarily come on immediately. It may take the camera a minute to boot up. The light on the switch doesn't necessarily indicate power. It could indicate that there's a computer there doing stuff. The power supplied first, and then that boots up the computer in the camera, and then that gets a network link, and then the, the circle of life is complete. Now, one of these cables I'm going to plug into our Synology. I'm using a low speed port on our Synology, low speed in this case being one gigabit, because even if I use eight cameras on this, it is not going to come anywhere near saturating a full one gigabit connection. And our NAS is coming on and booting up. Now, at the back of my NAS, I've got one network connection to the main rest of our network, and I've set up our NAS. If you're not familiar with setting up your NAS from scratch, you probably should want watch one of our other videos, but it's pretty plug and play. You plug it into your network and you're good to go. For the other connection, it's only connected to this. So this isn't connected to the rest of our network. There's a thing on your network, generally, called a DHCP server, Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. You plug that in, and that's the thing that's telling your computers you plug that in and that's the thing telling your computers, you know, what IP address to use, how to get on the internet, blah, blah, blah. For our purposes, we don't care that the cameras can't get on the internet. We don't care about any of that. We're going to set up the Synology as a DHCP server. But here's where you got to be careful. You can't just turn the DHCP server on on your local network because it'll conflict with your main DHCP server and it'll break internet for all of your other devices on your LAN. So understand that we've got one interface on the Synology that's used for our LAN connection and we're going to have another interface that's used for our cameras. And so the Synology will be the, the dynamic host configuration server, protocol server, for our cameras, but not the rest of the network. And so it's important that these maintain physical isolation. You may be tempted to say, like, oh, I'll just plug this into the rest of the network. You could do that. You could 
plug this 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 power over Ethernet switch into another network switch or into your you know ISP modem or your router or something like that, and then get DHCP signals from whatever your ISP has, and these will get IP addresses. That would work, but where that is not a great idea is when you have untrustworthy cameras like these. If you do it like this with an isolated network, there's no chance that somebody over the internet is going to be tapped into your cameras because they're physically isolated behind Synology. I trust Synology security a lot more even than their own cameras, and especially more than third-party cameras, in terms of internet security. If these can just get on the internet, there's not a lot on your network to stop them from phoning home or doing anything like that. In this setup, on the Synology, where this, it's using a separate physical interface on your Synology, and you configure your Synology as gatekeeper, there is no reason for any of this to be able to get on the, the internet. And so these cameras physically cannot phone home if you set it up this way. All right, let's dive into the pre-setup in our Synology software, getting the DHCP server set up, and then see if our cameras show up on the network. Now, every different PoE switch is gonna be different, but our ingenious PoE switch has a little button on it that tells us what mode we're in. So you can see we've got green, orange, green, orange, green, green. Now, the green, green connection is to the Synology. The switch is not providing power to the Synology. PoE is smart enough to know, hey, you've plugged in a device that doesn't want power. It's not gonna send power, so nothing bad will happen. And then on the other two where we have orange, it's actually telling us that we've got a different link speed. If you hit the button and change the LED mode, then it'll switch to power mode. And we can see from the little legend on the front of this that, yeah, two of the ports are asking for power, one isn't. So this is maybe useful if you're troubleshooting something where it's, I think it's got power, but I'm not 100% sure. Because sometimes you're not using pre-made cables for this. You, you fished your own cable from a spool of cables, and then you've used crimpers to actually crimp your ends on. And if you did something wrong, then PoE is not going to work correctly. And you can see if that is at least working correctly by using your LEDs and your diagnostic button. So it's handy. So first, we're, what we're going to do is go to the package center and look for DHCP. We're going to install that. While that's installing, we'll go to the network section of control panel and get the lay of the land for our network connections. Yours will be different unless you've got the exact same Synology model. This will show us the network connections that we've got connected. You can unplug the one that goes to your power over ethernet switch, your camera network basically, and confirm that that's the one that says disconnected. Hmm, it's thunder. You can plug in and unplug and confirm that that's the one that says connected and disconnected as you do that. And then we want to set an IP address manually. We, we're only doing that on this side of the device because this is the device that's going to hand out connections. So in this case, I'm just going to arbitrarily choose 192.168.55.254 and my subnet mask is going to be 255.255.255.0. Now 192.168 is reserved for internal use. 55 is an arbitrary number. Yours could be different, but I'm trying to pick one that is not likely to be used anywhere this thing might end up. And then for 254, that's the last usable address, and that just makes my life easier because I can say this is the last device on the network, and the DHCP server can be numbered 1 through whatever, which can also be convenient for cameras because that can be 1 through whatever as well. So IP address 1 could correspond to camera 1 if I dot my I's and cross my T's as I do this. If you want to just pick arbitrary random wild numbers out of a hat, you totally could, but that's how I'm setting this up. When you enable the DHCP service on the Synology, it wants you to set some options. Strictly speaking, because of the way we're using this, we don't actually need a gateway or a DNS server. DNS is what converts a name like a google.com to an IP address. And the gateway address is the address of the computer that is responsible for allowing access to other networks. In this case, we're going to specify the IP of the Synology for both of those. The Synology can act as a gateway and it can act as a DNS server for the cameras, but like I say, we're not actually gonna go through and set up the rest of that because our cameras don't need to get on the internet, so we don't need those options. Once you do that, you'll also notice the DHCP clients tab lights up. You can use that to keep an eye on what shows up on the network, and you can also assign static reservations. What that means is the IP won't change over time, because if this thing loses power and everything has to reboot from scratch, and maybe it takes a few hours for the power to come back on, you're not necessarily guaranteed that all of your cameras will get the same IP address from the DHCP server when everything comes back. And that's that 3600 that I set. So when I set 3600, that's about a one hour lifetime on the DHCP, which means the cameras will check in with the uh, Synology about once an hour to say, hey, what, am I, what network address should I use? And they'll negotiate and hopefully it stays the same. And it will stay the same if you set it that, way in the GUI. 
See, there's a physical address called a MAC address, and you can find that on all of these uh, physical devices. <laughs> it's not MAC like Macintosh, it's Media Access Control. And that is a globally unique number, mostly, that is serialized to the device, basically. And it tells you a lot of information about the device, the manufacturer, and then the, the individual number. So you can really use that for a lot, but in the software you can basically tell the Synology, hey, when you see this MAC address, always give it this IP address. It'll act like a reservation and it'll prevent the IPs of your cameras from changing. I'm gonna go ahead and plug in our naughty High K Vision camera as well. Now sometimes these cameras, especially third-party cameras come, they're actually hard-coded to a static IP address and you have to enable DHCP if you want to use dynamic configuration as in you plug it in and it just asks the network, what should I be? Uh, some cameras will default to 192.168.1.64, for example, and so then you would have to go through the headache of setting up a laptop or something like that to be 192.168.1.62, and then log into the camera and then configure the camera, or use the camera software to configure the camera, but you can't 100% trust the camera software to configure the camera when it's, you know, we're talking about entity list cameras, playing with fire a little bit here, but eh, it's fine if you know what you're doing. All right, so immediately in our client list, we've got two cameras and the actual ingenious Fit Switch itself. The Fit Switch, because it's web managed, wants to be on the internet so that you can manage it. But it also doesn't have to be web managed. You can just give it an IP address and log into it over the web, because it's just a switch. There's not really a lot of fancy going on here. So I don't even care if it's got a static IP address, but I can go ahead and hit the checkbox for the cameras, make their address static, and then it'll never change. From here, we can go ahead and set up our Synology surveillance station. Now this doesn't set up the surveillance side of it yet. The surveillance side of it, we gotta go back to Package Center and install Surveillance Station, or update it if it needs updating. Once we do that, it's gonna say, hey, I need to install some other stuff. If you don't already have the other stuff that you need, you just hit OK, it'll do it all automatically. And then it's gonna open in a browser tab. Now it's important to remember there are also Surveillance Station applications that'll work standalone. You don't have to use the browser interface. The standalone applications work really well, both on mobile and desktop but we'll use the web interface for now just to walk you through it. It actually comes up with a little wizard that just gives you kind of a tour of what your interface is. You should run through that and read this. It's good, useful advice. You can also connect this to Synology's cloud with C2 surveillance and get some other extra features and it starts you out with a free trial of that. I'm not gonna do that. I mean, C2 is cool and all, but I like the fact that everything runs locally and is stored locally, and <laughs> what happens local stays local. It's like, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. It's like that, but it's your camera system. Now, it's automatically detected the cameras. This is a sign that everything is working. If for some reason your cameras don't come up, you do have the IP addresses. You can feed it here, 192.168.55. something in this case, but it should just come up automatically. Now notice that, our, that this camera is missing, the one that I've plugged in here. It's getting power and it's working, but it's not really working. And that's because we need to reset it or because it's got that different hard-coded IP address that we'll have to jump through some hoops to, uh, to deal with. Now because this is actually a clone Hikvision camera, it doesn't actually have a reset button in it. Normally there's a button that you can hold down as you plug in the network cable, which will cause this device to reset. You can see that we got the little red light on on the inside of the dome which means that it does have power and it is doing stuff, but it doesn't show up on the network because it's configured for another system or software's out of date or you know whatever like that. This gives you the opportunity to name the cameras and get a little preview image. It will force you to initialize the cameras because it knows that they're new. It asks you to set a camera password and account. This is a good security practice. You can write this down. This is different from your Synology admin account. You can create a cameras account, whatever you want to do, but you should save that information because you'll need it in order to reset the cameras or access the cameras directly without the Synology at some point in the future. Your uh, authentication credentials that you enter here will also be saved on the Synology so the Synology can authenticate against the camera. Because remember, each camera basically has its own computer in it. You're configuring the computer in the camera, and it's just the Synology software is making that setup step a little easier on you. And again, if you're in a hurry and you're doing a lot of these, these little quality of life improvements are really worth the price of admission here. If you opt to do the quick setup or the complete setup, you've got some codec options here. H.264 has a larger file size, but it's easier to seek and index. And let's say that you want to jump to 
2.03 a.m. on a Tuesday. Even though the file is larger, it'll seek a little bit more quickly. It'll work a little bit better across a wide variety of client devices. H.265 is a more modern protocol. It uses way less space. It's generally a similar quality, but because it is so much more compressed, it's a little bit more of a struggle for devices to deal with. If you have very modern devices, H.265 is generally safe, but sometimes the Synology client software, like especially on a mobile phone, if the mobile phone doesn't have full support for H.265, playback can be a little bit of an annoyance. In mid-2023 when I'm making this video, that's mostly a thing of the past, but if you start with H.265 and you have strange problems, come back into your camera configuration and pick H.264 instead, and then you'll know that that was the issue that you ran into if you have a black screen or the camera doesn't work or it doesn't seek in a uh, reasonable speed. Uh, when you're doing seeking inside the software, if you need to jump back a few days to 2 o'clock a.m. on a Tuesday or whatever, uh, H.264 should generally be able to do that in under about 3 seconds. H.265, on, again, on, on hardware that really fully supports it, is going to be about the same speed, but if you have software that doesn't properly support it, you'll either get a black screen, the application won't respond, or it'll take in excess of 15 or 20 seconds. Your mileage may vary. Oh, and not every camera supports H.265. Generally, everything supports H.264. These cameras support H.264. A lot of the time in the documentation for the camera, it'll say, oh, I support H.264, H.265, H.265+, H.264+, and some other codecs that are listed there. Just depends on the camera that you get. If you get a little pop-up, depending on which Synology NAS you have, that you don't have the H.265 thing installed, that's available in Package Manager. It's Advanced Media Codecs. Just go there and install it. When you set up the cameras, it gives you some options. Do you want to record all the time? Do you want to record only when there's motion? Uh, generally, you do want to record all the time. Even if you would like to only record when there's motion, it'll still flag when there's motion, and you can still search by that. But sometimes it's useful because it doesn't always classify things as motion, especially if there's something that's far away. Even though these are wide-angle cameras, they're not meant to capture things that are happening far away. So. If you set one of these on a garage or something and you're trying to get a wide angle view of your, uh, you know, of your driveway or something like that, it's generally better if you have fewer cameras that are more close to the action. Because nothing's more frustrating than you get the camera set up and, you know, somebody, you know, turns in your driveway and leaves some old tires in your yard. It's like, well, I sure would like to know what their license plate is since they, you know, illegally dumped some tire waste in my yard. That's a thing. It's going to be hard to read the license plate from that far away because it's super wide angle. Different security cameras will have different lenses on them. You can have a zoom lens and set it up. Sometimes you can get a camera where you can actually go into its web configuration and set that. And the Synology software also supports what are called pan tilt zoom cameras. So you can control a camera remotely. I'm sure Synology is working on all that for their lineup. This is really a first generation product from Synology for their cameras. but. You know, again, you got some free licenses on top of the licenses that are bundled with these. So even though you can only install two cameras for free, these don't count against that. So you install these cameras and then you can get a PTZ camera. You can order something off eBay because generally that's pretty cheap. Especially this stuff, super cheap because everybody's getting rid of it. And if they can't get on the internet, nah, that's probably good enough for your home connection. Now under the setup here, we can see we've got both cameras set up. It didn't use any available licenses. This chassis, because it's the XS Plus, remember, Synology XS. Check out that other video. It'll support up to 128 cameras, not just 40 that we've seen in, in the past models. It depends on the model. Check your fine print for your device. Yeah, this thing can handle 128 cameras? Oh yeah. There's some extra steps that you can go through to set up face recognition and license plate recognition, as well as time-lapse recording. Yeah, you can have these things automatically compress a bunch of time where not a lot is happening into just a few seconds, and then when there's motion, it'll slow down time. It's a little easier to manage uh, complex events that way. Maybe you've got a camera set up on a porch and you can get a little bit of a motion of a tree or something in the background. You can set up rules to say ignore this part of the frame or treat a little bit of motion like that as no motion or unless you fully recognize a face, don't worry about it. So you've got some options. And if you're recording everything all the time anyway, and it just doesn't flag it to look at if something sideways does happen, you still have footage to review. Whereas if you set it up not to record when it doesn't see motion or anything else like that, you, you may be stuck because you don't have any recording of that. 
You can also set up complicated rules like to email you or use notifications. You can sign into your Synology account, and this is where it kind of dovetails with the C2 surveillance. And you can set some pretty advanced rules in terms of things that you want to happen when motion is detected or license plate or face or whatever. Now because this camera is running software all of the time, it'll detect neat things too, like tampering. When I pulled the plastic off of the camera, it knew that the camera moved a little bit and it said, hey, that was a tampering event and it flagged it as a tamp tampering event in the log. So if you'd rather review your video logs as text rather than video, welcome to that future where we can, we can do that. It said, oh, there's a face that was detected. That was me, that was my face, there it is. Because these have microphones, remember not all jurisdictions allow you to use the microphones, but that's up to you, you could toggle that on or off. It was able to detect my voice and do that. But you can also create other rules like, hey, someone says the word hello, that will trigger something and that'll go into the event log. You can configure the rules for that. Now again, this is a first gen product, so it, it doesn't really do it super amazingly well for really advanced stuff. It's not as advanced as Alexa or you know a voice assistant, but it is surprisingly good. And this is very cool given that all of this is running locally without anything in the cloud and isolated from the internet as well, which I'm sure that your neighbors will appreciate. It's not possible for Amazon to just reach in and grab your footage, as has happened time and time and time and time and time and time and time again with Amazon's Ring and Echo and Alexa and all their other products. It's no wonder we don't trust big technology. Synology also incorporated home mode, which allows you to change the rules depending on if you're home or not, or depending on if there's a toggle. So if you only want to record video when you're not home, for example, you can set that. You can also create camera groups and have a group of cameras where, okay, these are the inside cameras. I don't want those to record when anybody is home, but the outside cameras can record 24 seven. You can use home mode to do that. And if you install the Synology surveillance station app on your mobile phone, iOS and Android are both supported, you can toggle home mode on and off from your device. You can even set some custom rules so that, like if you're an if this then that user, you can do some stuff with that. But again, it's really stretching the capabilities of what the platform can do right now today. Some of that is also tied in with C2 surveillance. You can get access to some of these more advanced features through Synology C2 Cloud. So again, there, there are some, some upselling options here into the rest of Synology's ecosystem. But it's still pretty interesting what they're doing. If you want to get really fancy with your surveillance system, you can integrate things like uh, a doorbell that includes a camera so that you can unlock a door for a door buzzer system and get really advanced. Uh, an external control stick, so if you wanted to have joystick control of a movable camera. There's some integrations for higher education and point of sale, you know, retail type integration. You can get really fancy with this. Now a lot of cameras can do face detection, vehicle detection, etc, etc, but you're going to have to configure that on the cameras individually unless you get Synology cameras. So you have to plug your laptop into the PoE switch, go to the IP address for your specific camera, and fine tune like the face and vehicle detection. But not so with Synology cameras. You can just go in the Synology NAS software. It knows how to speak Synology. Imagine that. Synology knows how to speak Synology. And you can configure things like, okay, it's not just face detection. I also want loitering. If somebody loiter, loiters for 10 seconds or 5 minutes or whatever you want to dial in, then you can do that through the software. Similar with uh, vehicle detection. It's like, there's a vehicle in this image, but it's not moving, so don't detect that. Just detect a moving vehicle, or just detect a vehicle that stays there for 15 or 20 seconds. You have full control over all of those little parameters in your software. You can also set up a region or a polygon where part of the image ignores motion, or part of the image ignores vehicle or face detection. So maybe your, your house is overlooking a street. It's like, I want to see a face on the porch. That should be logged, but don't log a face it's out on the street because that's out on the street. Or even setting up a region where we're going to just physically block it out. So we can't even physically see faces on the street. But if a face comes onto the porch, then I'm going to record that. And that's just something nice you can do for your neighbors. But these are the kind of options that may be available in your cameras. And you can configure that through the web interface on your camera. Or if you have a Synology camera, you can configure that kind of thing directly through the web interface here.
you set a polygon for face detection that's just the part that you want and it's going to honor that that's what the green square is it's not possible with the system that i have here but you can even get more advanced than that not just face detection but actually individual face detection and assign them to people it's like yeah you can build a little database of people inside the surveillance station software and have the cameras recognize individual people now if you're going to do that you need a synology that has dedicated video processing capabilities the xs18 plus uh or 1823 plus is uh uh, not designed for that. It's a general purpose NAS. Yeah, it can support 128 cameras, but this is not really designed to do a lot of video processing. And the face processing that happens on the cameras is local to the cameras. You need sort of intelligence working on the camera as well as the NAS if you want to say, wait, that's Bob. I know Bob. Wait, that's Tim. I know Tim. You can get that. Synology has some devices that do that. But it's a little beyond the scope of this video. We're just, you're, you're setting up surveillance for you know, your home or your small business or your, your storage unit, something like that. Your really big storage unit with a lot of crap in it. This works really well for that use case. And it's basically plug and play. It, it couldn't be simpler, really. Like this is uh, more capabilities and higher resolution and a better frame rate and a better image quality than commercial systems that cost twice as much. It's actually very impressive what Synology has been able to put together. You'd be hard pressed to, to build your own from nothing that is a better value and is also more reliable. So overall, it's a pretty impressive system. And I've really only scratched the surface of what the system's capable of. But this is uh, the Synology surveillance station along with the new Synology IP cameras. I really hope that Synology uh, continues to take over the IP camera market. There is uh, a lot of room for innovation there. Uh, I've tried uh, Hike Vision, they're okay. But you know, the danger aside, Rio Link, which Rio Link is okay, but they're not really super reliable in the long term. Like they're going to have to update their devices to have a three year or five year warranty to win back trust because they're pretty sensitive to lightning and everything else like that. Um, if you want to check out more content on this, check out Tom Lawrence because they've done very large system installations like this and they've posted a few YouTube videos about it and their long term usage of some different brands of IP cameras. Now, Synology is a new brand of IP camera. So they're just sort of entering the foray, but I think it's a pretty strong uh, entrance given that these cameras have a three year warranty. The warranty is really, like you wanna put these in and you wanna forget about it. And like I say, I do wish that they were eight megapixel instead of five, but the image quality from the five megapixel image here is really good. The depth of field focus, the width of the image. These cameras are designed to be no more than about eight to 10 feet away from their subjects. So, you know, if, if you get a wider field of view, you know, a driveway, you're just going to be able to say, hey, stuff is happening in the driveway. You're not going to be able to zoom in and read a license plate the way that you would from, you know, an 8 or a 12 megapixel camera. Of course, those cameras cost a lot more as well. You can also invest in a PTZ camera where you got an optical zoom, and then that matters less. If you got a 5 megapixel PTZ camera that had a, you know, a 30x optical zoom, then yeah, you could set it up and read that license plate, no problem. But it gets into a whole other world about digital IP surveillance cameras, and I've already run out of time. I'm Whittle, this is Level 1. I'm signing out, and you can find me in the Level 1 forum.